Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. On this episode, I actually had the conversation in my car, um, in my rental car, that is. Uh, I was in Washington State and visiting my family, and a friend of mine here in Nashville, uh, Willow, she asked if I maybe wanted to speak with her sister, Rebecca, because Rebecca has had an incredibly interesting life, full of all sorts of twists and turns, trials and tribulations. It's quite a story. Um, Rebecca uh, was helping out Willow and Rebecca's brother down in the Olympia area of Olympia, Washington, because uh, Rebecca's niece was going through chemo. So we didn't really have a place to to connect when I drove down there. Um, That would, you know, be appropriate to have the conversation. So we did it in my car in a parking lot. Um, it was very kind of Rebecca to meet up with me and and she was so forthcoming and open and I really appreciate it. Um, this conversation I feel could not be more timely even though uh, we had it back in September. Um, we talk about Rebecca's story and it certainly reflects what's going on right now in politic and in the conversation at large. Um, We talk about consent and what it's like for a young girl um, who, well, I don't want to give anything away. The story, you have to hear it for yourself. Let's just suffice it to say that uh, what we talk about is very important to hear. I think it will shine some light on some stuff going on just in general. in the world. That being said, um, there is, uh, she, I, I talked to her earlier today actually, we were discussing stuff that she was going to give me to put on the links page on heyhumanpodcast.com and um, she wanted to make it clear that she is pro-choice. Um, that decision, that, that's an important thing to note even though the decision she made and again I don't want to give away too much I feel like it's very hard to have this preamble without giving anything away so just that being said she is pro-choice yeah um what else oh um Amazon affiliate I am now an Amazon affiliate with Hey Human. so if you need to do any Amazon shopping I humbly request that you go to heyhumanpodcast.com Right at the top of the homepage, there is an Amazon portal. You click on that and it will take you directly to Amazon. You shop just like normal. And uh, in doing so, the affiliate program gives back uh, a a tiny percentage and that helps support Hey Human, um, which is great. If if you are willing to do this, I'm much appreciative. Um, Yeah, so Amazon affiliate on the heyhumanpodcast.com homepage. Um, Please rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or any of the podcast apps you might be listening through. They all do uh, review sections. Um, iTunes especially, rate and review would be great. It helps just get the word out. I know I repeat myself every episode and say these things, but you know, it helps to grow it. And it's exciting. It's, we're heading toward 18,000 uh, listen, so that's exciting. Um, actually, we're just gonna push over that, I think, with this episode. Um, what else? I'm trying to think. Uh, if you want to get on my newsletter that comes out every month, I talk about all sorts of things. Um, you can sign up for that at susanruth.com, and there's a, there's a button on there to subscribe to the m- newsletter. Please do so. And you can find me on social media, uh, either under Susan Ruth. Ism, ISM, or under Hey Human Podcast. Um, I try and stay pretty active on those things. And always email me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. Uh, and oh, good to, thing to mention if uh, you are looking to buy music for the holidays or anything like that, uh, or just, you know, put on your workout CD. I don't know. You might like yoga, there's some good chill songs. Go to iTunes and check out Susan Ruth for music because I have 
a bunch of songs up on iTunes under Susan Ruth. Uh, and that would be great. I'd love to share that with you. I saw Killing of a Sacred Deer last week. And boy, that movie is super intense. It's really good, but super intense. Um, so if y'all like intense movies, the same director writer as uh, the guy who did The Lobster, which is a surreal film as well. Um, anyway, for no other reason other than to say, I recommend it. Killing of a Sacred Deer. But be prepared, you will be gripping your seat cushion for sure. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of Hey Human. You know, I do this, I love it so much. And for me, it's about making the world smaller. It's about connecting us. It's about saying, hey, we are all the same. We just happen to be brought up in different circumstance. That's a really important message for me to get out. And I know not everybody agrees with me, and that's okay too. Um, But hey, that's part of it, right? The idea that just because you don't agree with what I have to say doesn't mean that I can't listen to what you have to say. I don't have to agree with it either. I love that. In fact, I grow from that. Anyway, just wanted to say that. And a special thanks. It's This is the week where we're supposed to give thanks. I have mixed feelings about Thanksgiving for obvious reasons. For those of you who have listened to me over these past 76 episodes, I'm sure you understand where I'm coming from there. Uh, But it does not change the fact that I am thankful, and I'm thankful every day. And I appreciate all of you for listening and for helping to spread the word. Um, Thanks. Okay, here we go. All right, Rebecca Askey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. It's Thanks awesome. for being on Hey Human. Yeah. In the car. This is my in the car Hey Human episode. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. Here I am. This is, where? What city am I in? Lang- Lang- Olympia. Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I wasn't sure because all the signs say kind of different things right Yeah. It's kind of Lacey and then Olympia and it kind of, it, it's kind of all one. Yeah. Olympia, Lacey, Tumwater. Yeah. I got excited when I passed the Slater Kenny sign because. Oh. The band Sleater Kenny, who's oh, yeah. from down here, and yeah, yeah, so that's pretty cool. I was like, yeah. oh, so it went by. And I also passed a huge group of motorcycle folks, and I, there was so much traffic around me. But I was like, oh man, that makes such a cool picture. There was, this, yeah. I mean, it was a giant pod huh. of motorcyclists. It's a whole bunch of motorcyclists. The pod, I don't know. <laughs> Sounds good. Anyway, uh, so I appreciate you being on the show, and uh, your story, from what I've read. Um, is pretty intense. I mean, you've lived a, a, a lot of things within your lifetime. Um, I don't know what you're comfortable with talking about, if you're talk- comfortable with the whole story of you or what, but... Um, pretty you... much anything. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Um, growing up, you grew up in... I grew up in a pastor's home. In uh, See, I was born in Yakima. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dad is a pastor, mom is a nurse. And I was the oldest of three kids and uh, traveled a lot. Went from Yakima to um, Ashland, Oregon, well, Mm -hmm. Mansfield, and then Ashland, Oregon, then down to Reno, Nevada, over to Oklahoma, back to Reno. Wait, why why travel so much? Um, What's up with that? Is that, okay, that's awesome. uh, The way the pastorate works is you're there for a season. Oh. For whatever reason, sometimes they're long seasons, sometimes they're short. Just depends on the church and the denomination. Okay. Um, my dad uh, was in Mansfield for five years, little little tiny town mm-hmm. out in the middle of nowhere. So, um, I think he and my mom wanted a bigger city, and so uh, we moved when I was five to Ashland. It was a really troubled church, so we weren't there long. It was just a couple years. A troubled church, and that there was um, just unorganized, or no. I would say church politics. Ah. Uh, typically, a church is run by both the pastor and the elders. And so, a lot of times, the pastor and the elders clash as far as the direction. Yeah. So, I saw the movie Footloose. I know. Yeah. 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 It's kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not too different. Yeah. So, um, so, is it a common thing then, or is that for the particular branch of religion you guys grew up in, that, that moving 
pastorship? Is that is that um, common in church? I would I say it was pretty common. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. It, okay. it really depends on the no- denomination, okay. but I would say primarily pastors will stay at a church. The average term is about two and a half years. And what is the denomination? What branch of Christianity? Uh, the denomination back then was Church of God. Okay. I yeah. Heard of there that are one. several Thanks. branches. There are several different denominations of the Church of God. Okay. And his was based in Anderson, Indiana. Uh-huh. Um, it's very similar to like the Nazarene uh-huh. Church. Um, it's Arminian in its uh, belief, so it's a little different than Baptist. Baptist is more Calvinistic, um, but but similar. It's a comes out of the holiness tradition. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, the average term is about two and a half years really for any denomination however um and were you a super strict religious home pretty conservative yeah yeah pretty conservative there's more conservative than we were but we were pretty conservative um uh, no drinking no drugs no i mean that's typical anyway but um yeah it was it was good i mean it had as good points and it's bad points like any denomination any religion sure um and we moved from ashland to reno and um reno was a little bit too wild i think for my parents back then so um we moved to oklahoma and and how old are you at this point the the see we were in ashland i was five or six then we moved to um, Reno, and I went to grade school in Reno until I was in third grade, mm-hmm. third, fourth grade. Um, it went to Oklahoma, it was about fourth fourth and fifth grade was in Oklahoma. Um, now, were you doing well with making new friends, or like many of the kids who get shuffled from city to city, it's awkward and strange? Were you outgoing? Were you shy? I think I was pretty outgoing until junior high. I was pretty um, talkative, didn't have trouble making friends. Um, to me, moving was exciting. Mm. I loved traveling. I loved the drive from Reno to Oklahoma was amazing to me as a child, seeing the different parts of the country. It was always an adventure, going from one thing to the next. I was um, very involved in my dad's church. Always wanted to know what was happening, why it was happening, and who was happening to what, <laughs> when. Yeah. And uh, so probably knew more than I should have. In fact, I know I knew more than I should have as far as church politics go. Mm. Um, And I also, the way for me to have a relationship with my dad was through the church. That makes sense. Um, He was very, he was a full-time workaholic at the church all the time. And so the only time for us to see him is if we were on his terms in his church sort of thing. How many children in the family? There's three of us. Mm -hmm. And Are um, you the eldest child? I'm the oldest. Okay. Uh And uh, we lived in... uh, what's called parsonages mm-hmm. um, right next door to the church so it was easy just to walk next door and see dad in his office and read his books and go through his stuff and, and things like that um, went to Oklahoma and um, that was different because it was a diff- different kind of country than we'd been in before it was very flat and very hot and big bugs and lots of tornadoes and um, it was uh me and my sister, her name was Debbie back then, and um, my little brother Dan, and um, the church was not, again, was not a well church, not a healthy church. So we were there for a couple years, went back to Reno. My dad decided he was done with the ministry, been hurt too many times, and um, I lost his faith there for a while. Really? Uh, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Questioned a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so we went back to Reno. Uh, without him having a job or a place for us to live and ended up in the downstairs apartment of a friend's house, their friend's house, without anything, without uh, a job. He went to work as a tire salesman and then as an insurance salesman and consequently our life had been about ministry and now it was about something totally foreign. didn't have a church home, didn't have... So you stopped going to church as well? We we stopped for a little bit. My mom was very faithful in taking us to the church that was, you know, the Church of God in, in Reno. Um, so we went there and for another time went to a Baptist church, but it was different because your dad's not in charge. 
And was so your dad vocal? It's just different. Was he vocal about his losing his faith? Or what, did he keep it to himself? No, he kept it to himself. We just knew because he wasn't going um, but something was to up. church as much. He began smoking cigars, which I know it sounds silly, but we were like, oh, my dear God, you've lost your salvation. We're going to hell now. Because <laughs> that was just so foreign. Yeah. <laughs> it was just such this shock. And <laughs> it's just so silly. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, he didn't talk at all about it, really. He didn't talk. He didn't talk much, period. He was very silent. Um, and he was, again, poured himself into work, so we didn't see him much. Um, and he was a very angry man for a long time, for many reasons. Even back when he was at the church, he was a very angry um, man and, and abusive in some ways. Never physically, never harmed us at all. Um, just absent. And you weren't quite sure if he really liked you or loved you or if we were more of a nuisance to him. Do you um, think that shaped how you were in relationships later? In oh, life? very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very much so. Absentee fathers tend to... Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He and I had a hard relationship. Um, so, and, and at the same time all that was happening, I started junior high. In Reno. In Reno. In sixth grade, because that's when they started junior high back then. And I went from this innocent kid that knew nothing and was exposed to nothing to now being exposed to everything. Uh, you know, it was a very rough junior high. There was a lot of um, gang activity in there, which amazes me now. But it was it was a different day. There, there was um, drugs everywhere. And what year would this be? Sixth grade. But what year do you, I'm just to put well, it in a kind of. Um, let's see. 84, 83. Late 70s? Oh, okay. Wow, gangs. I guess I don't think about yeah. 70s having gangs. I yeah. thought you were going to say like 80 something, but. It's early 80s. Wow. Late 70s, early okay. 80s. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um,. So it, it wasn't like the big city, like you hear now, the Crips and the Bloods and all that sort of thing. It, it was more like kids that weren't parented that hung out and did mm -hmm. drugs and passed it on and pretended like they were gangs. I mm -hmm. mean, it was, as I look more back. More like West Side Story. Yeah, as I yeah, look back, it was like, it, it felt like, oh my gosh, or these the people outsiders. are going to kill me, you yeah. know, you know. Um, and I actually, the, my initiation on, to my sixth grade campus was um, to uh, cover kind of a barricade me and the other new girls had to stand and the guys behind well the guys behind us all smoked pot and the rule was we couldn't tell anybody that they were smoking pot and me being the good church kid immediately went up and said hey they're smoking pot back there oh shit <laughs> that wasn't good did so, you get in trouble for that uh, from the yeah other kids? i did um it was pretty rough what'd um, they do I, well i got um made fun of a lot. I got slammed into lockers. Mm. Um, I was made, yeah, I was made fun of a, a lot. I was a, a kid that, you know, I was 11 years old. I hit puberty early, so mm -hmm. I looked like I was probably 13 or 14. And um, I, my face was covered in zits and pimples and, sure. you know, I was... Uh, that puberty weight you gain when you're that age a little bit and as I look back I wasn't fat but I felt fat I felt huge and um, part of that was because of what the kids told me that I was sure. and then uh, my dad was always trying to get me to lose weight and mom was always taking me to different weight loss uh. Uh, places and um which in retrospect, if I would have been allowed to just grow up and be a normal kid, it would have all come off naturally instead of developing into a food issue later in life. But that's yeah. a different story. <laughs> it's all the same story, yeah. actually. Yeah. I mean, really, it is. it's the story of you. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it was that was a really rough junior high, really rough junior high. 
Um, and I learned a lot of things I didn't know before. And You mean drugs, sex, and rock and roll? The whole thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The whole thing. Were you maintaining your innocence with all this around you, or were you getting sucked into that environment? I got sucked in because it was the way to belong. Sure. Um, we didn't have church, so we didn't have the church friends or family. So then my friends became the friends that I tried to glom onto that were there. And um, a lot of them were partiers or smoked. And then um, a lot of them were older. And so I got involved with the group of kids that were 15 and 16. So I'm, you know, 12, 13, and I'm hanging out with 15, 16 year old kids. And we went um, cruising. The thing to do in Reno was to go cruising every Friday night. So you got in the car and you just went down Casino Boulevard back and forth. And really, you didn't drive. You just, it was kind of this parking lot, this mass parking lot. People got out of their cars and smoked pot together in the middle of the road. Hmm. And um, so I was... uh, (laughs) It's like a movie. It it was. It was weird. Um, So I was 14 on one of those cruise trips down that boulevard, uh, Casino Row, and... um, my friends were 15, 16, 17, and um, they parked the car, and we got out, and we were in this gas sta- at this gas station, I guess, store in front of this 7-Eleven type store, and um, they were all drinking and smoking pot. I didn't smoke pot because I didn't really know what to do with it, and I didn't have it myself. It was the other people that had it, and um, my friends got, and I got into this guy's car, and then they left me with this guy that was a total stranger that I had no idea what his name was I and I and I'm trying you know this is like so long ago I can't even remember there's just details I can't remember but um uh ended up um he offered me his pipe that he was smoking that moves pot and I tried it and I didn't really know what I was doing it didn't do anything and um, I handed it back to him, and he started kissing me. And um, was an older man. Oh yeah, yeah. He was at least in his thirties. Um. And he said he was going to take me home, and he wanted to kiss me first. And so then he kissed me. And in my mind, the way I was raised, my mom had told me all about sex, but it had never occurred to me that somebody would try to have sex with me before marriage never occurred to me once and I don't know why that is but it in my world people didn't have sex till they were married and I just thought that's I knew other people had I guess I don't think I ever gave it much thought but I never thought it would happen to me I just didn't think about it and so when he started kissing me I didn't know what to do because it was the first time I'd ever kissed anybody and And um, you were 13 14. 14. Mm-hmm. And um, then um, we started having sex, although I didn't really in know that's car. what we were going toward. Yeah, in the back seat. We were in the back seat. I was in the back seat the entire time because the other girls were in the front. And then when they left, I just stayed back there. And then he got in the back seat with me. Did you? Were you protesting, or did you not quite understand what was happening? I didn't happening? understand what was happening. Yeah. Um, I let him kiss me because I thought, oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. He must like me. He right? must think I'm attractive. Yeah. Which, especially coming um, from coming the from place. my thing, I was like, yeah. oh, that's awesome. This guy really likes me. Yeah. And maybe we'll have a relationship. And blah blah blah. You know. I mean, that's stuff. logic for a... It's logic for a 14-year-old back in the late 70s, I guess. Well, maybe it, even maybe now. even now, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, um... I, he didn't ask me if I wanted to have sex. He didn't talk the entire time. He just started kissing me, shoved me down on the back seat, and um, started taking off my pants, and, I, and he asked me if I was a virgin. And I said yes... And um, then um, I said, I don't want to have sex. And then we did. 
but it went it was just like this really quick thing like he just he raped you and then that was that yeah and and the and it and it was violent in that I didn't know what was coming next and in that it was all about him and so my body wasn't prepared for what was happening and so and because because of the violence I was in and because I was a virgin I was in a lot of pain and I tore really bad and I bled really bad so I was bleeding profusely and um, trying not to cry and said I need to go home and so he took me to my friend's house because he I didn't know how to tell him to get to my house but he knew this friend that we'd met you know that we had been in the car previously I guess and so he took me to her house and it was in the middle and I was like th probably three or four o'clock in the morning and um, her parents called my dad and he came picked me up did they understand what had happened? No, they didn't know what had happened. They just thought I'd been out partying. They thought I had been staying the night at a friend's house. And then when they picked me up, they realized I'd been out somewhere partying. They did, the, thought. did the parents of the girl who knew the man, did they know something was going on? No. And you didn't know this man's name and okay. No, I never saw him again. Um, I think I might have, I think he might have told me his name. I have no memory of it. Did you confront the friend that knew him? No. I didn't I didn't think I had been raped. It didn't occur to me. I thought that this guy liked me. Mm. And so that's how I came out of the car, thinking, oh, he likes me. I might see him again. But you're in pain and bleeding. Yeah. And, yeah. So it's kind of two different things. I'm in pain and bleeding, but this guy really likes me, and I think he might be my boyfriend now. Got it. Okay. And so when he took me back to the house, they're all dark. They're all in bed. And I knocked on the door, and my friend answered the door, and her parents woke up, called my parents. I don't remember any conversation about where I was or where I'd been with any of those adults. My, and uh, my dad didn't ask me. Hmm. Um, came into the house, and my mom was there. My mom was a nurse. Um, she said... Go take off your pants and go put them in the washer and um, go clean yourself off in the shower. So she understood something had happened. She did. I didn't know that she did until as I look back and as being a mom now, if my 14-year-old daughter came home bleeding and had blood running down her legs all over her jeans, I think I was probably in shock because I don't remember saying anything and being told to go clean up. Not, let's go to the hospital, right. let's file. I should have been taken to the hospital sure. because later on in life I had to have corrective surgery because of that night. Wow. Um, so, that's what I did. I cleaned myself up, took a shower. And nobody spoke of it again? Nope. They... The very next week, there was maybe two weeks apart from that first instance. It was at Christmas. This was all at, during the holidays at Christmas time. Thanks. Uh, Christmas Eve, my um, that year, my parents had put me into a private school, so I was in a private school that year. We carpooled with another Christian family, and this family had four kids. Uh, the mom and the dad, I babysat their four kids all the time. Great couple. And you're how old at this point? I was 14. Okay, same, yeah. same time. The same time frame. Same this time is when time. this okay. is like yeah, yeah. all happening. Okay. That year I was 14. Um, they, um, he, Michael, the husband, called me up on Christmas Eve and said, "Can my wife's working, she's a nurse, she's working overnight, can you come, me and the guys are going to go out and babysit the kids. And I said, okay, that sounds great. And so I went over there, and um, and this is not even probably two weeks after that had happened. That after the in the car, rape, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
he said, uh, come babysit. So I said, okay, went over. He picked me up, went over and babysat for him, but he didn't leave. And so he, he, he and his, um, I thought his friends were picking him up because that's what he told me. That they were going to go out and go do whatever. And so I put the kids to bed and he said, hey, come watch TV with me for a little bit. And um, so he turned on Benny, Benny Hill. Is it Benny Hill? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty body for a 14 year old. Yeah. I'd never seen it. I was like, wow, that's a pretty thing. So then he, he uh, gave me, um, he said, do you want something to drink? And I said, yeah, I'll have Coke or whatever. So he gave me a Coke and it was a regular Coke. And then um, watched some more stuff like Benny Hill. I don't remember what they were, but they were so similar to that. And then he um, put something in my drink. I don't know what it was. And he said, do you want to play strip poker? No, he said, do you want to play poker? And I said, I've never played poker before. So he said, well, I'll teach you how to play. And so he taught me how to play. And I was pretty buzzed at this point with whatever he'd given me. And he said, do you want to play strip poker? So I said, okay. So um, we played strip poker. Um, got to the point where I had my shirt off. And he says, well, I think we should go finish this in the bedroom. So I said, okay. So did you understand what was happening? No. No, I was too out of it. You were drugged. I, I was something. I don't. Yeah, yeah. I, the room was spinning. I went Your and I sat down on the bed, and um, we finished playing until my pants were off, and then he turned off the light. And when he turned off the light, the entire room was black. You could not see anything. I mean, it was pitch black, and. Um, I could, so I couldn't see him coming. I didn't know where he was. And he came and um, pushed me down on the bed and started kissing me. And um, I, my thought was, well, I'm not a virgin. And so that's just all I could think of is, well, I'm not a virgin. And then um, I couldn't see anything. The next thing I knew was that um, he said, open your mouth. So I opened my mouth and he put himself in me. And that was totally foreign to me. I'd never heard of such a thing, let alone people actually did that. And these are people within your church group, right? This, like, this, yeah. They weren't in our church, but they were at, they were at the families school. at the church school. Yeah, yeah. Got it. And so. Not that that matters, but I yeah. always find it interesting. Yeah. And he was late thirties. I mean, again, that was with four children, with four children and a wife, and yeah. And so, um, he so he was upside down on me with his, you yeah. know, stuff in my face, and then he got up, and it was still pitch black. And well, then we had sex, and then he got up, and then it uh, was still pitch black in the room. And then he went off into this side room, turned on this light, threw a washcloth at me, and said, Clean yourself up. I'm going to take you home. So I'm curious when you were having sex, was it your mind was like, Okay, I've already done this, so whatever this is, apparently this is just how it works that men just decide, excuse me, decide to have sex with you, and so you. Yes. Yeah. 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 Because that's all you knew. Yeah. I'd never had a boyfriend. Right. I'd never... Of course, we know that they are doing something terribly wrong in retrospect, but in the moment... I just thought that's what it was. That's just that, how it that works. Was, I never occurred to me I was being raped either yeah. time. And your parents in never totally talked to different about ways. stuff? Or, no. No. Mm -mm. Okay. No. No. It was... It. Yeah. And that kind of comes up a little bit later, but... Yeah. At that... They... He came in... And he, I said, I'm going to take you home. Get dressed. I'm taking you home. And then he said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Um, I think the problem is I haven't been baptized yet. And I said, I didn't say anything. That's and he, what he and said? Yeah. I said, I haven't been baptized oh yet. Oh, my God. And um, then he said, don't tell anybody. Um, and I said, I'm not going to tell anybody. And so then... He took me home, and then I thought I was in love with him. I mean, I hung out with his family all the time. His 
wife saw the hickey on my neck that he gave me and she she when she was taking me to school one day it, or a couple of days after that or whenever yeah i don't remember I <laughs> you know no, time okay. time is like what happened no, I know. I um yeah. and no she worries. said do you need to go to planned parenthood and i said why and she said well are you sexually active and i said well, i think so and she said well maybe i need to take you to planned parenthood and I said, well, why? <laughs> she said, well, you probably should be on the birth control pill because you don't want to get pregnant. And I said, well, I'm... Had these men ejaculated in you as well yeah. and not used condoms? Correct. Yeah. And um, I said, well, it didn't occur to me that I could get pregnant. I don't know why. Because my mom had taught me all about the functions of it. Yeah. It just... I think a lot of times there's a disconnect for teenagers yeah. or, you know, kids in general. Of what yeah. it all... Yeah. And so, even some adults, to be honest, yeah, I think there's a disconnect. And so, um, my parents didn't know about that, and he never touched me again. After that one time. After that one time. Did uh, did she take you to Planned Parenthood? She did. And did they she took notice me in your pelvic exam that you were something? It was severe a bizarre had... time. It was in the '70s. It was in the house. It was the, in a house. It was in a house. The clinic was in this old house. It had been transformed into okay. this. I thought you meant like clinic. somebody's. No, it was weird. It was like it looks like a house, but it was a clinic. Okay. So I I go up to the counter and I fill out these papers and I don't know what I thought. I the nurse is out. So she, I'm standing at this. The, there's a living room. I stand in line at this like bar at the kitchen bar and I'm filling out these forms and the nurse is at the back door smoking a cigarette. <laughs> classic <laughs> it was so funny now looking back like what era was that so, <laughs> she's smoking a cigarette and she goes well how many men have you slept with honey <laughs> i said well two and she goes did you use any protection i said no she says well what are you here for and i said i don't know oh man <laughs> so <laughs> she gave she had me go upstairs, and I had a pelvic exam. First time I'd ever had a pelvic exam. She didn't say anything. And you were already, uh, you'd already started menstruating. Yeah. Menstruating, so yeah, yeah, I started when I was 11. Okay, yeah. So and um, she didn't say anything. Um, gave me some condoms. So she didn't notice the trauma. She didn't notice or the trauma. If she did, she, if she, didn't, did, say she didn't say anything. God, 70s, man. What the hell? She, it was just bizarre. She didn't ask me anything about my yeah. sexual experiences. Yeah, because now they're they're very specific. Oh, very. So it's you totally get different now. Are you? Yeah. Totally different now. Yeah. Um, handed me some condoms and I left, and um, it was so weird. And uh, were you still continuing to babysit for this person? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. did his behavior toward you change? Uh, he's he didn't really talk to me after that. Okay. Um, he told me couple times that you know it shouldn't happen because um you know he's married and he, oh and I said well what if I get pregnant and he said that he couldn't have kids it, even though he had four yeah so maybe he had a vasectomy I don't know maybe, yeah. he just told me he couldn't have kids and um but he also told me that he loved me he told me that that night and then he he would tell me that other times you know whether you know in passing or whatever just I'm sorry that shouldn't happen you know I love you just don't tell anybody yeah that was the manipulation of course yeah, yeah. Um, I actually wrote him this letter dear Michael I'm so in love with you and um, gave it to him he, he never acknowledged it and uh, then we moved from Reno up to Olympia. And um, I became this very angry teenager. I was Understandably. pissed. Yeah. I was really pissed. I was pissed at my parents. I was pissed at the church. I was pissed at everything. God. At God. Every, every single thing. I was just an angry, angry kid. Did you remain sexually active? Or I did. did. You, you I did? just... every. Moved up here to Olympia. Um, in my head, I had been promiscuous because I'd slept with two guys. So therefore, I was promiscuous. 
and um, slept with three guys all over the age of 20. And I was 15. Um, Are you gay? I wasn't promiscuous. <laughs> when you say promiscuous thing, okay, sleep around. I slept with three guys once each. <laughs> so I understand. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> I'd had nail sex five times. <laughs> right, totally. Um, were you... Were you getting any sort of, pl- and obviously not the first two times, clearly, but as you, since you put in your mind, like, okay, now I'm just going to do this, were you getting any kind of pleasure at all, or was it no. still just rudimentary? It was very rudimentary. Yeah, I figured. So. No, the yeah. first guy, I don't remember his name. I met him, I was with some friends, met him, um, we had sex in the backseat of the car. Yeah. Um, it, and again, it was like, oh, this is a repeat sort of thing. Sure. Um, although different, he didn't force me. It was just very... Right. You know, and then the second time, um, this guy, he was in his 40s, and um, I was actually friends with his brother, who was like 15 years his junior or whatever, and so I went over to his house because I was um, going to party with his brother and my other friends that were there, and then this guy in his 40s took an interest in me and he um, we had sex and then um, about the same time I met this other guy um, and he was an older guy and we had sex so it's interesting that they're all so much older I yeah mean, I, it was you know I'm sure and I'm, in some part of the psyche it plays into the father abandonment stuff, and but maybe not. Maybe it's just the, yeah. the older men back then were more predatory, but guess what? They're still predatory. Yeah, it's <laughs> interesting because I don't know that they really ever knew how old I was. Yeah. Because I was 15, but I probably could have passed for 17 or 18. Sure, I understand And, and that. It, back then, there wasn't a, the... Stigma? Stigma. Yeah. It just... I understand. Um, and I'm not saying that all old men are dirty to yeah. old men. I'm just saying Well, that. the guy that was in his 40s actually told me he was 37, which isn't much better. But um, so these, but these three were, guys were happened back to back. Consensual. Huh? And they were consensual. Yeah. Yeah. As um, much as a person in your understanding could be consensual. Yeah, my understanding was you make out, you have sex. I They're just like... There's no in between part. Yeah. You just you make out, you have sex. Right. And um, because I was promiscuous, and the reason why I thought it, the other reason I thought it was promiscuous, when we moved up here to Olympia, my parents tried to understand why I was so angry, and so they took me to this Christian counselor, who I did tell about those first two. Um, I didn't describe them as rape because I didn't have that language or understanding that that's what it was that had happened to me at all. Um. And he told me that I had was asking for it because I was promiscuous. I really hate that word promiscuous. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> told, he told my moment. parents because I was so promiscuous, I couldn't be around any men and couldn't even be around my male cousins because Say, I might what? seduce them. This is what the therapist I'm said? like 14, right? <laughs> yeah, this is Wait what the therapist Okay, said. so your therapist told your parents that oh, she's such a hussy that she's going to have sex with her yeah. own yeah. cousins? Yeah. Great therapist. Yeah. It's awesome. And he didn't tell them about Michael or that he was married or any of that stuff. He just said I had slept with two guys. I was promiscuous. And and so. Nothing like therapy, uh, therapist, parent, confidentiality And if I stuff. disobeyed my father, I was to go out into the backyard and dig a hole. Dig a hole. With a shovel. Because? Because that would put me in submission under my father and that I was obeying a command that he had given me. So, that, awesome. That'll. <laughs> did you end up having to dig a hole? <laughs> we <laughs> we did. We. <laughs> uh, my dad told me something. I don't remember what it was, and I said, "No, I'm not going to do that." And uh, he said, "Well, let's go dig a hole then." So it was at nighttime, and uh, we were out there. He hands me a shovel. He's okay. Dig a hole, and I said, "I'm not digging a hole." He said, you are too digging a hole. And I said, I'm not digging a hole. So we fought back and forth. I said, I'm not digging a hole. You dig the damn hole. <laughs> You're digging the damn hole. Oh, my God. I said, who do you think you are? You're smoking cigars. <laughs> and you left the church. So you tell me how good you are. <laughs> so, you said that? Yeah. Good so girl. we got into this big battle back and forth. And finally, he throws down the shovel. He says, never mind. We're not digging the damn yeah. hole. <laughs> so, 
I'm sure we somewhere in there he saw the ridiculousness of I it. I was just like, what in the world was that? <laughs> anyway. So your mom never sat you down and said, what's going on, honey? She's a nurse. She didn't say, hey, what the, what the no. hell? No. 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 Uh-uh. Huh. She, um... So I slept with those three guys. It was my freshman year. Uh, just after I turned 15. Um... And I uh, was pregnant. And um, from did you know from whom? No. I knew based on my period that it wasn't the first guy, so it must have been the next two. And but I didn't know which of those two. And so it was again at Christmas time. This was a year, just a year from the previous, you know, Christmas from hell. But um. So I went to, actually knew I was pregnant. I went to Planned Parenthood, got on a city bus, went to Planned Parenthood, which was in a normal place this time. And uh, they said, I, they told me I was pregnant and told me what my three options were. And um, abortion, abortion, adoption, or parenting. And um, I said, well, I can't have an abortion. And um, uh, I said, I guess I'll parent. And what is adoption? And they kind of told me, and they gave me some paperwork. And um, my mom at the time was going to a counselor. So I said, Mom, I want to go to your counseling appointment with you. And... Um, Not the whole guy, I hope. Huh? Not the guy that said dig a hole. Hopefully it's a different counselor. Different counselor, yeah. Okay. And so... Uh, I said, I want to talk to the counselor first. And she said, okay. And so I went in and told the counselor, I said, I'm pregnant, and I need to tell my mom, so can you help me do that? And she said, yeah. So we brought my mom in, and the counselor said, Becky has something to tell you. By the way, let's just acknowledge the fact that that was a very grown-up thing for you to do, to have the wherewithal to say to the, to go to the therapist and say, hey, help me do this. That's, that's huge. It's remarkable. I don't... I didn't know how else to do it and I knew it was going to break her heart and I knew that she really liked this counselor and it was a safe place for her mm -hmm. and so I told her I, that I was pregnant and she burst into tears and she sobbed and sobbed and sobbed I've never seen my mother sob like that and um, we went home and told my dad. My dad at this point had gotten back into the church. He was the assistant pastor at uh, the Olympia Lacey Church of God. And so my mom called the senior pastor, Ray, over to the house and told Ray what was happening and said, can you please help us tell, you know, my dad. So he was there. Boy, oh boy. And so my dad came in and um, said, what's going on? And I said, well, I'm pregnant. And my dad didn't say anything. Um, turned and walked out of the room. And my parents knew, out of those three guys, they knew of one. The one that had told me that he was in his 40s. because, Or in his 30s. Because he was a friend, acquainted with a girl in our youth group that I had been hanging out with. Mm. And so they assumed he was the father, and they I let them assume that. I didn't tell them about anything else. They were going through too much. So, um, Dad wanted to send me away to Jerry Falwell School for Unwed Mothers, um, and Mom said no. His thinking was I could give the baby up and come back, and we could all move, go on with our lives. I went to the church and told the youth group um, the same night that dad told the congregation and he was prepared to hand in his resignation and the church said no we're not going to accept the resignation you're part of our church and we love you guys and we're here for you and that whole thing which is really good um, I, it, uh, this was in 1984 83 and then new year 84 I was pregnant and um, 
they had a one of a kind teen parent program in the high school. It was uh, one of the first that ever started and started here in Olympia. And so teens would come all over and enroll in Olympia High School in their teen parent program. So I started in that. It was the most, I had the best teacher ever in my entire life. The teacher that taught that class was an incredible advocate for women and young women. And Do you remember the, the name? Her name, Mrs. Crump. Crump? Mrs. Crump. Barbara She's Crump. She's still alive? I don't think so. Oh. I did contact her a few years ago. I stayed in contact with her most of my life. Shout out to Barbara Crump. She you are. was amazing. She, when I first told her my story, She just, she put two arms on my shoulder and she said, honey, you do realize you were raped, don't you? And I said, no, I wasn't. <laughs> and she said, yes, you were. He said, no, I wasn't. <laughs> I never said no. And, you know, I didn't fight her. And she said, no, you were raped both times. And she said, even the man that you're, that you're pregnant with his baby, that's statutory rape. And, um, which my parents also decided to press charges against him for statutory rape. And he ended up taking back off to wherever he was from, I don't know, somewhere else, other state. He didn't get convicted. No, but when the detectives went after him, lo and behold, he did have a record, quite a long extensive record of a variety of crimes including extortion and embezzlement and ended up being in, in his 40s and with a wife somewhere. Of course. And, um... Sorry, I don't have Kleenex. Oh, that's right. And, uh, let's see. Oh, I've got one in my pocket. So, that must have been, in its own way, a re relief of, so of sorts, like, to know that this wasn't your fault, to... It finally made things make sense like what normal relationships are and she really spelled it out for me really clearly yeah why all that was harm and rape and not normal and not okay and why my mom should have taken me to the doctor and why I wasn't promiscuous and I wasn't a slut right and She, she, she changed my life. I, just, I, she just really did. I'm um, so glad. With armed with that knowledge, did you go home and say, uh, "Excuse me, parental units who are supposed to be protecting <laughs> me, well, WTF, man"? No. Did you have those conversations, or did you just have a, an anchor in Barbara and just Barbara? Yeah. Um, and my own faith at that point was pretty strong. Oh, yes? Yeah. Um. Well, that's interesting to me. Is it... it but it wavered for a moment. And then you found... Because you said that you were... Like, I did. I, it wavered at... Not so much God at, as it was the church. Ah. Um, and they were very different to me. Yes. I, I'm with you on that one. So, um... I... I and I never felt bad about being mad at God, if that makes sense. I think he's okay with it. And I've always felt like he was okay with mm -hmm. it. Like, um, so it, I, I didn't, but I, but at that point when I was carrying my baby, I, my thought was, I got to take care of a baby. And how am I going to take care of a baby? Cause I'm 15. Yeah. And they had a daycare on campus. And my all my friends were parenting, and um, I just thought I don't want to put my baby in this daycare all day long. It was dark. It wasn't run well. It was crap, honestly. Um. And uh, and again, I I just I want to applaud you because for at 15 or 16 years old and having these conversations with yourself 
and understanding that you have to do what's best for your child is huge. I mean, I hope you acknowledge that in yourself, that that's a really, that's a really beautiful altruistic thing because I imagine the emotions you were going through were insane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to um, parent. I bought a crib, I bought clothes, yeah. and I was sitting in math class. And I, I thought I wanted my baby to be safe and have a father and have a normal family and have things I couldn't give him. I didn't want him in that crappy daycare. I knew it was a boy, even though I hadn't had an ultrasound, I just knew it was a boy. Hmm. And, um, so, this may sound weird, but I was talking to God saying, I don't know what to do, because I can't give him that stuff. And he said, uh, I felt him say, I have another family for him. So I said, okay, so let's start looking for a family. Um, Because with with me growing up in God, I'd always had these conversations with God. It was just, that's just part of my makeup and who I am still. And so um, I looked at hundreds of families, went through this agency here in town, couldn't find a family. And uh, because I had to be perfect. (laughs) And I couldn't find the perfect family. And I was getting worried because I was about eight months along. And uh, he was due in August. And my aunt flew out from wherever she was from. I don't know. Florida. (laughs) That's where all aunts are from. (laughs) Yeah, from Florida. And uh, she said, hey, I know these people that know these people that need, that need, that need and want a baby. Yeah. And um, can I have them send you their stuff? So I said, sure. And and they did. And it it looked like a little house on the prairie family (laughs) out in the middle of nowhere with the farm. This farmer father and this pretty little wife. And she had been a nurse. And so she could take care of him if anything happened. So I thought, okay, if he gets sick, you're going to know what to do, right? (laughs) You're going to know how to take care of him. And so I felt like he belonged there. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm choosing you guys. And so I uh, wrote my son a letter telling him why I was giving him up and bought him a teddy bear. <laughs> and, um, he was 15 days overdue when I went into labor, um, very tough labor, was not able to deliver normally, so I had a C- C-section. He was under stress, and so I had a C-section. Was that due to the abuse you suffered as a child, you know, a couple years earlier? I don't think so. It, several years ago, I found out that uh, my uterus is tipped. Oh, okay. And so... Um, sure. Uh, I don't think I could have uh, given birth naturally. Um, So he stayed in the hospital with me for three days. And when I got out of the C-section surgery, I held him there. And uh, when I got out of the recovery room, the attorneys were there. And so I signed the papers without any adult around. Not realizing that that was I was not done right or legal, but I didn't know that till decades later. Um, my mom came up and she saw them there and she said, "What'd you do?" And I said, "Well, I signed the papers." And she didn't say anything. And he was in the room with me, and I took care of him for those three days. And my dad came up. And my dad had and I hadn't talked most of the time I was pregnant. And he came up and held his grandson and was just bawling. I'd never seen my dad cry. 
I had heard him once, but I'd never seen him. And um, he told me he loved me. It was the first time he'd ever told me that. Wow. And he said, we can keep him. You don't have to give him up. We can keep him. And I said, we can't do that, Dad. It's too late. And he said, no, we can, we can keep him. And I said, no, we, we can't. I signed the papers. And if I would have thought there was a way out of it, I would have kept him. I didn't know I had three days to make up my mind. I didn't know it wasn't finalized. Because I would have ran down the back staircase with him. I was ready to several different times. Because um, at that point, I was like, no, I'm keeping him. And then um, his uh, Willow was there, uh, Debbie at the time. She held him, and my brother did. And um, Then his parents flew out from Iowa, and I met them there at the hospital. Very, very sweet, kind people. And my grandfather was there in the room, and I uh, had a nice talk with them. As far as I can recall, I don't remember much. This is the farmers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The farmer and his wife. And uh, they promised to, to take care of him and thanked me, brought me roses with a card that says, through your gift of love, we have shared in the blessings of God. And then they left the room. And then the nurse came in to take my son, and I fell apart. I just couldn't do it. And the only way I could, mentally and emotionally and every other way, was, in my mind, it was just me and my baby and God. And I felt God say, give him to me. I'll take care of him. And so I did. And and, uh, two weeks later, I went back to school. (laughs) And I went back to the teen parent program because I didn't know anything else. That first day of school, all my friends had their babies. And I had my book of pictures and pictures of him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, thank God for Mrs. Crump. <laughs> yeah. Um, She had me talk, and she kept me talking, and talking, and talking, and talking. And um, I actually stayed in that teen parent group until I graduated. I was in there for two years. Wow. And the reason why she said, you're still a teen parent, you're a teen parent that chose adoption. And so she had me and my friends who had parented, and then some who had also had chosen abortion, we spoke on panels at the different high schools in the area Yeah. about our experiences and why we chose the decisions we did. And so I did that. And She was really a woman ahead of her time. She was way ahead of her time. Yeah, clearly. She was way ahead of her Which time. Which is fantastic. She was so awesome. Thank God for people like yeah. that. Advocacy is so important. She also important. taught me that I had a skill I didn't realize I had. Yes. And that led to my career. Um because she also she taught early childhood early learning and she um, had me take her class because she thought I would be good with kids and uh, she taught me everything about early childhood and about kids and children and I fell in love with it and she used to watch me and she told me I had a gift and so my first job was um, at 15 working in daycare at a child care not the one at the yeah, school sure, but sure sure another one and I ended up getting a degree in child development that's fantastic and uh, spent most of my life working with kids and um, then I went off to college went to Bible college and um, 
I don't know how much long how long you want to go. I mean, I would love to hear. I know that this story keeps going. If you're if you're down, are you getting warm? Do you? It's have to a leave? long story. Could it, we maybe take a break? Yeah, of course, okay. absolutely. All right. So, graduated, went off to college, and decided to go to Multnomah School of the Bible. Mul Maloma? Multnomah School of the Bible in Portland, Oregon. Okay. Um, where if it's Bible you want, you want Multnomah. <laughs> <laughs> is that their tagline? That yeah, well, was. I don't That's know if it still good. is, but that was. And it was Bible. <laughs> and um, so I went there and uh, started a degree in biblical studies. Mm -hmm. And um, always, always loved the Bible. Mm -hmm. And didn't know what I wanted to do, but figured I'd start there, go for a year and see what happened. Went for a year. It was extremely conservative, more than so than I'd been raised. And nobody knew my background. And That's always uh, nice, huh? It was nice. And I didn't tell anybody. And um, it was great. I had a dorm room and roommates, and I loved them, and it was awesome. Of course, we had to be in by 11 o'clock, and we had to wear dresses to class, and uh, it was a very archaic rules. They don't have those rules now, but they did back then. And <laughs> met my best friend. She's been my best friend to this day, Lisa. Mm -hmm. And um, she, to this day, just lives down the road from me. Oh, wow. She has a big, booming personality. She's extremely outgoing. She's total opposite I am. We met that first day. Um, I was 17 and been bonded ever since. Mm. She was the only one I told. Uh, that first night, actually, in the dormitory hall. And she told me her story, and I told her mine. And um, became dear, dear friends. And um, that first year was great. I went home for the summer, worked at a daycare. And in August, moved back into the dorm. And uh, two weeks into that... Um, got a severe headache that wouldn't go away and I don't remember much I was laying in bed and my roommate called the school nurse and they took me to the hospital and I was screaming in pain because I had pain that would start at the base of my spine and shoot up straight through my head like a contraction every few minutes it was just it was like a contraction um, just every few minutes is horrible pain and uh, they couldn't give me enough drugs to take care of the pain. And so the doctor came in and asked me if I used drugs. And I said, I don't use drugs. I go to Bible college. <laughs> anyway. Uh -huh. uh, she <laughs> so she's looking all over my body for marks. <laughs> but it was just excruciating pain. And I don't remember the next few days. I think they actually put me out. And um, when I woke up, I couldn't feel anything from my uh, chest down. I um, was totally paralyzed. Um, from my chest to my waist, it felt like I was asleep, um, numb and tingly. I couldn't move my arms. If you put something in my hand, I couldn't tell you what it was. And I couldn't, from my waist down, couldn't feel anything. My God, that must have been terrifying. It was. Um, and then... Uh, they were trying to figure out what it was, you know, and um, finally came up with this disease called transverse myelitis, which is a rare disease uh, that affects the myelin sheath in the spinal cord that hits uh, one in a million people. And so um, I was in three different hospitals, ended up in Puyallup at the uh, rehabilitation part of the hospital there. In the course of that, um, almost lost my vision. Jeez. Um, I was on a breathing tube for a while because I wasn't able to breathe on my own. Um, that was, as most of the disease progressed, that was the furthest it got. Um, and then they told me that I wouldn't walk again. And so in the rehab unit in the hospital, they... Uh, taught me how to do life in a wheelchair which you know you learn a lot when you can't move because people have to do everything for you you know they shave your legs they wipe your butt they wash your hair they you don't have any uh, 
pride or um, privacy. In fact, at one point I remember they have you on a uh, schedule to go to the bathroom. So they every few hours they sit you on this pot that looks like a seat. Yeah. And they put a blanket around you and so I'm sitting there on the pot, and they're waiting for me to do my thing. Of course, I can't tell when I've done my thing, so. Oh, jeez. Um, so, uh, and, and walk the elders from the church. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> they're there to anoint me with oil. <laughs> You're like, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> I didn't say nothing the whole time. Just let them do whatever they're going to do. <laughs> Oh, so they did that, but my friends were great. They came to the hospital <laughs> early on when I was I had all these tubes coming out from everywhere. One of my good guy friends came up, stood by the side of my bed, and immediately passed out. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, but they taught me how to, you know, as it progressed, they taught me how to drive a car with uh, hand control wheels, and I had occupational therapy all the time. And wow. Standing time. They put you in the standing machine that lifts your body up, and you stand for a while, and she got to chat with all these other people in the standing machine. Um, it was a whole different world. It was a whole different world. And um, I practiced every day and started to get feeling from my chest to my waist back. So with this disease, was it just a virus? Was it a genetic? It's a, it's a neurological disease similar to MS. Um, but uh, with uh, transverse myelitis, the lesions are in the spine, and it okay. affects the myelin sheath. And so what had happened is that it, it, it gotten all swollen in there. And one-third of people get complete recovery. One-third of people um, get some recovery, and one-third of people get no recovery. And based upon how it had advanced in my body and the, and what hit the stages I was in, they thought I was in the no recovery part. And so... Um, uh, that was probably the only time I threw my Bible was when I was up in the room and they told me you're never going to walk again and um, I said well that doesn't work for me and rolled myself back down to my room and got mad at God and um, threw my Bible and then I picked it back up and um, said okay but I'm going to bug you every single day of my life until I walk again. So you can either, either take care of my legs now or you're going to take care of them in heaven. But either way, I'm going to bug you because there's a story in the Bible about the unjust judge. And right now that's what you're being. <laughs> so, so that's what I did. And so, um, you sassy minx. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, by the time I left the hospital, I was in my wheelchair and uh, could get around pretty good. But... When I got home, I never used the wheelchair. I practiced every single day. I had leg braces and arm braces and these arm crutch things that mm -hmm. would hold me up. And I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced until I could walk with that down the hallway. And then eventually um, it went away. Um, went back to school. That started in August and went back to school in January. Incredible. I went back to school with a cane. I was still walking slowly, and I still couldn't hardly feel my feet, but I was walking. And um, I'll never forget, it, back in those days, of course it was before cell phones or anything, we didn't have phones in the room, there were four phones for the entire dorm, and if you got a phone call, your room buzzed, and they told you which phone to go to. And you had to race to get it, because it could be a while with switchboards, and so you didn't know if you are going to actually make the call before they hung up. And I really wanted to get this call, and so I started running. And all of a sudden, realized I was running. I went back oh, down on the floor. No. <laughs> but that was that was it. It was it was uh, incredible. That was I mean that was a very short story part of it. I mean because the whole thing was really long at the time, and there was a lot that happened during that. But but uh, were yeah. you safe the whole time? No, in the hospital, um, there was a couple things that happened in the hospital. Um, when I was paralyzed, they have to have, before you can, before you learn how to transfer yourself, um, 
and back in the early part of it when I was still very ill and very in much in pain um, the nurse tried to move me and I told her that she could not move me by herself that she would need to get help and she wanted to move me anyway I think she was trying to get me over to a bathroom or something and um, she dropped me and I was on the floor and I, I couldn't move myself and so she pushed a button and people came running and they picked me up and put me back into bed and uh, uh, but I was bawling I was just bawling and I called my cousin it was in the middle of the night um, just bawling I said I, I can't I can't live I can't I can't I can't brush my teeth, I can't wash my hair, I can't, I can't do anything. Um, the only reason I could even have the phone is because the nurse put it right here <laughs> and put the thing up to my ear and I was just bawling. And uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. And then when they had me do physical therapy in the hospital before they actually moved me to a different hospital um, there was a this guy that you know and you're in a hospital gown that ties in the back and it's and I'm already getting used to the fact that people are taking care of me and he was sitting there by my legs and he was wanting to move my legs and do different exercise with them and I felt very exposed and I um, Felt, it was probably the first time I had a flashback mm -hmm. to things that had happened before and um, I started crying and I said I need you to stop and uh, he wouldn't stop um, and he didn't he didn't he was inappropriate in that I felt like he was not hearing me and not he was exposing me and I didn't want to be exposed and I didn't see the need to be exposed. And so um, I uh, told him I'm all done. And I, my chair was right next to where I was on this thing. And so I moved myself into the chair and left. And um, yeah, but you're very vulnerable when you are dependent on so many people and you don't know them and you don't know if they're safe people or not. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was very scary. Um, and then I went back to Multnomah and I was behind now. My friends had moved on because I'd missed a semester and I started dating and uh, that was interesting because they were all most of the guys there were looking either to be missionaries or pastors and so they were looking for a pastor's wife and um, my background did not fit that mold and so when they would hear a little bit or sometimes one in particular well, a couple heard this my stories it was just like from you or were other from people? me okay yeah we would date for a while, and I would think, okay, there's probably safe. some things you should know, or sure. I feel safe sharing this part, or yeah. whatever, and no, they wanted to marry a virgin, mm. very clear about that, mm. so that would be the end of that, and um, it was odd, but... Now, during this time, I, I don't remember, uh, in the laws and back in the 70s and early mm -hmm. 80s, um, mm -hmm. weren't really great for the adopt, the mothers mm -hmm. who put their children Oh, up. yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, yeah. had you been keeping appraised yeah. of what was going on with your son? Or? So what we did is, um, back then, adoption just started to be open, and I consider it an open adoption. It's not like it is now. Now adoption is completely different. But they had agreed to send me letters and pictures um, throughout the first year of his life and then every year until he was five and then I wouldn't hear anymore um, they also um, because the father has to give permission you know 
and I, they thought this person was the father uh, that they'd gone after for statutory rape. They um, put an advertisement for him in the paper at some off-the-wall paper out in the middle of nowhere, and of course he never answered, and so he advocated his rights. And so... Um, Abdicated? Ad, 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 yeah, whatever. Gave up. How you say every Well, I would, because I mean, yeah. I, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, he, he, he said, go ahead. Or he, because he, he didn't Because respond. he didn't answer, yeah. he lost his rights. Right, got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I just want to be clear. Yeah. Um, so therefore, uh, he could, he could never in the future come yeah. back. Um, I, throughout that, the first year was horrible because I was in so much grief and, I, I was postpartum and I was depressed mm -hmm. and it, it, it was so painful. I'd gained 50 pounds during that pregnancy. And so I had toxemia, I was just really not well. And um, just overwhelming grief over just, it, it's almost like a death. It's yeah. just, I, imagine. I wanted to see him. I wanted to know what was happening. And I couldn't get enough pictures, and I, yeah, it, it was rough. I wrote to them to send me more. They wouldn't. I think they were afraid I was going to come back. They were very scared. Um, they'd lost, I didn't know this at the time, but they'd lost a previous adoption that had fallen through because the birth mother changed her mind at the last minute. And so they were, they were fearful. Sure. So I, um... Okay, so they they were concerned you were going to come back. So yeah, but they they still upheld their yearly. They did. Uh, they sent a few pictures that first year, um, and some really sweet letters telling me what he was doing. Did and, you feel good uh, about them as parents? I did. Good. I did. Um, every year, then on his birthday, they sent me a letter. Uh, she wrote, would write a really long letter um, telling me everything she could about him. Yeah. How she, uh, you know, how he was picking beans out in the garden and all these different things and feeding the pigs and I, very farmer's life, you know, and how he loved uh, throwing the beans at, you know, different animals and um, really gave me a good picture of, of how he was growing up sent me a picture. He was probably two of him in a pair of roller skates. Uh, a lot of pictures with his dad, which was cool f for me to see. Um, and they, they were totally, totally loved being parents. Just you could tell everything they wrote, everything they said. Um, and then the last I heard was his when he turned five. God, that must have been insane. No, I take difficult. that back. It was when he was three. It was up until the age of three. Wait, they didn't. Uh, the agreement was up until the age of three. Oh, okay. I was nice five, but it wasn't. It was, it was three. Okay. I wanted it to go longer, but they would not agree to that. So. Ugh. What so, did you find out? What is what they named him? Or. Yeah, they told me in the hospital what they were going to name him. Yeah. Um, it was uh, Carl. Mm -hmm. They named him Carl William. And um, he was a big baby. He was a beautiful baby. Almost nine pounds. Whoa. Yeah. That's big for back then. And long. Yeah. Yeah, he was a big, big boy. He still is a big boy. <laughs> um, In other words, you've seen him. Mm-hmm. He, uh, uh, many years later, when he turned 21, just before his 21st birthday, his parents contacted the attorney um, that handled the adoption, and he called me. And I wasn't home, but I saw the Iowa um, address on my uh, caller ID, uh, Iowa uh, zip, uh, area code. And so I knew it was him. And I'd had a dream the night before. Really? And uh, I dreamed that he was calling and looking for me. And he was um, asking where I was. Oh, my gosh. And so I just had sensed that he was going to contact me. And it was uh, actually it was on a Good Friday. And um, see, I called the attorney back. I said, "Is everything okay? I know you called. You didn't leave a message. Is Carl okay?" And um, he said, "Yeah. He just wants to have contact with you. Is that okay?" 
And I said, yeah, I'd love contact. Are you kidding? That'd be awesome. And um, he said, okay, well, you'll hear from them in time. And a few months later, I got a letter, long letter from his mom and his senior pictures telling me that he wasn't ready for contact at this time, but that he had just graduated high school and was off to um, summer camp. He was working a summer camp, Christian summer camp, and that he would contact me at whatever point he felt ready. And um, I was grateful to have his senior pictures. I was devastated. Yeah. Because I wanted to meet him. And I wrote him a long letter telling him about me, about my daughter. Oh, you'd um, had a daughter since then? Mm-hmm, I'd mm-hmm. had a daughter. And um, told him as much as I possibly could about giving him space and the freedom to come when he's ready mm-hmm. and be a safe person for him. Um, I'm curious, when you saw the photo of him as a grown man, could you tell who the dad was at that yep. point? You knew exactly? I knew exactly who it was, and it wasn't the guy I thought it, I, that they had thought it was. Yeah. Which I'd kind of had my suspicions about. Uh, no, it was another guy. It was the other guy. It was the third guy. And, um, which is interesting, because I'd actually told both men that I was pregnant, and either one of them could be the father. And neither one of them wanted anything to do with it, and both told me I should get an abortion. So I never felt really any guilt about what they thought. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, no, he definitely looked his eyes. I could tell immediately. Um, and so I waited, and it was probably. A year later, maybe longer, um, he contacted me on MySpace. Mm. It was before Facebook, you know, Mm -hmm. it was MySpace. And he found me on MySpace, and so we started corresponding on MySpace. And uh, he would ask me all kinds of questions, and um, I, uh, you know, answered them as best as I could, and he was in a relationship with this girl and he wanted my advice about something and I'd already given him my phone number so I I told him you can call me anytime but we hadn't spoken at all and just emailed back and forth because it it, it was just email back then so it was email back and forth um, over this MySpace thing and so he on MySpace he wrote having worried about this girl what do you think blah 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 never mind I'm just going to call you I was like, you're going to call me? <laughs> and so a few minutes later, my phone rang, and it was him. And he said, hi. So what do you think about this? <laughs> and he went on about this girl. And Oh, my God. I just couldn't get over the fact. It was so surreal to me. Here I am listening to my son's voice for the first time in 20 years. Wow. And lis- I was listening to the tone, the pitch, you know, the emotion, the every single thing you can get out of a voice. It was just like I'm talking to my son, and he's, I don't think he thought about it for a second. I really don't. I think I, he just wanted my advice on this girl that he felt he was in love with, and what should he do, and that was all we talked about, was this girl, and this, and that, and so we had a few more conversations like that, and then pretty soon he started asking more about um, why I gave him up and what it was like and um, he wanted to hear pregnancy stories and um, wanted to know how I chose his parents and how I found out I was pregnant and why I didn't choose abortion and asked me all kinds of questions. Asked me if I knew who the father was and I said no but I think it's this person. I'm pretty sure it is this person. And um, I told him about, as much about that person that I knew, which was not much. Mm-hmm. And um, 
he uh, said, I want to meet you. And he was living in Nashville at the time. Mm. And so I flew out to Nashville on Mother's Day weekend and met him for the first time on Mother's Day. Wow. And um, he, uh, it was, it was, it was great. We were at the Opryland Hotel, and um, which is was back then a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And uh, we were trying to find each other, and so we were on cell phones talking back and forth. I'm over here by this garden. Well, there's a thousand gardens yeah. in that place, you know. Sure. And so then I saw him. Um, walking across this bridge thing and we just started running towards each other it was so funny we were both running as fast as we could threw our arms around each other we were crying and we we're laughing hysterically I don't know what the laughter was about but we were just laughing it was just laughed and laughed and we we're both crying and just both sobbing and laughing and um, he kind of picked me up and spun me around and um, it w we talked all night long I had put together a book for him, kind of a here's your history book. Yeah. Um, told about his genealogy, had pictures of his uh, great grandfather um, who had been a missionary and um, my mom and her four sisters and my dad's side of the family and then me and Willow and Dan and you know, just every single thing I could possibly put in this book for him. It was actually a box and uh, it just had mementos um, that I'd kept and different thoughts that I'd written out over the course of 21 years. Hmm. And um, he grew up very, very conservatively, much more conservatively, conservatively than I did. And uh, but his whole life, he'd, he'd grew up on that farm. And um, I uh, talked to his with his mom on the phone a lot, uh, and. Uh, that whole weekend she was concerned that he was going to get a tattoo and she wanted me to talk about getting a tattoo and I don't care if he has a tattoo it doesn't bother me in the slightest I could never figure out why that was so upsetting but, but uh, and here I'm thinking this is my weekend I don't I'm not going to talk this kid out of a tattoo he's a grown man <laughs> but that's not what this is about it was kind of funny so yeah, we had a great weekend. Went to church that that uh, Sunday at his church, and he introduced me to everybody as his birth mom. Oh, that's so lovely. Yeah, and then um, I met with him again. I flew out to Iowa and met him at his parents' house. Met his parents, saw the farmhouse where he grew up. Hmm. They both pulled out pictures, big boxes of uh, pictures, and showed me his entire childhood. That's amazing. So it was interesting. When I got off the plane and uh, walked... They, he drove me to the farmhouse, and um, Diana opened the door. And uh, right behind Diana were all these pictures on the wall. Like every year of his childhood, you know, the, uh, you could just see his whole life. And I just, uh, I was a mess. I just started bawling and it basically collapsed in Diana's arms just sobbing because I'd missed everything and I could see everything up on the walls you know in the history of the house and not everything but you know a yeah. lot and uh missed it and they showed me pictures you know all these boxes of pictures and just told me stories of him growing up and very sweet I went to church with him that day and uh, that weekend and his home church where he had been raised and mm -hmm. grew up and they all greeted me and he introduced me as his birth mom 
everybody in Iowa, you know, it's a little farming community, so everybody knows everything about anybody and anything. And so it was surreal to watch this life that happened because of a choice you made. Right. That those people would never have met him or had those stories if I had made a different choice. So it was really impactful to watch the consequences of that decision. Um, so it was good, it was a good weekend. Um, things got a lot harder after that. Why? Um, well, he flew out to Seattle and he met his birth family, which was great, had a great time, showed them all over the place, took them to the Space Needle, everything you do in Seattle for a tourist, you know, you take them everywhere, and uh, loved it, it was great. He met his sister. And he met Melody, yeah, and they look a lot alike, both blonde-haired, blue-eyed babies, huh. and now blonde-haired, blue-eyed adults, and um, uh, it, was, it was good. I took him to the hospital where he was born, took him up to the floor where he was born um because he wanted all of that he wanted to know every single thing you know I understand that and um so so we did and it was it was a good weekend and then he we talked on the phone every now and then that he wanted I think he thought after that that I don't know what he thought. I guess I thought, well, we'll talk every now and then. I'll fly out and see you. You come see me. You know, it's a that kind of a relationship. And he wanted me to write a book about him. And and I had I had written I had journaled the entire time, lots of journals, and I had talked about write maybe writing a book about it. And so he was very interested in that. And then um, he uh, went through a very difficult breakup with this this girl and became very depressed would call me all times of the day or night and what I did not realizing it was I I, I didn't have any boundaries with him because I didn't think I needed them and I thought I needed to give him whatever he wanted whenever he wanted and then uh, and he was living in Colorado then at this point and um had gone through this breakup and he started threatening suicide and uh, was threatening suicide with his parents as well and um, his mom called me and she thought I should fly out there with her and his aunt to Colorado um, and he said well I think what he needs is he needs his counseling I'm not sure that us flying down there is going to do much because it didn't appear to me to be um, counseling so much as it was or suicide attempt as much as it was severe depression and I, I was real leery about I felt he needed a professional hmm. needed professional help but we, I flew down there um, and met him and his uh, aunt and did an intervention with him. Um, we were in, um, he was in Denver and we drove to that town, I can't think of this close by, it's really pretty, Boulder, is it Boulder? I think it's Boulder. Really great town. And we were walking this really unique strip outside with all these street musicians and mm. really beautiful place poetry all over the place kind of like a street fair almost and we walked into a restaurant we were eating lunch and he was again why did you ever give birth to me you should have just had an abortion mm. why did you ever give me up on and on and on and on at this self-pity this incredible just self-pity 
And in my mind, look, kid, you've had a great life. Yeah, a breakup's hard. I could tell you about a few. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just had a horrible marriage that ended in a divorce. So I know what that's like, all right? But listen. <laughs> he and I just and they were they were his aunt and his mom were it's okay. Would you I mean just babying him. Mm. And I finally had it and I stood up in the restaurant and I said, "I'm done. I am so done." And I walked out. And he looked at his aunt like, aren't you going to follow her? <laughs> so anyway, the, we were in the middle of the street and they were following me out there. And I just started yelling at him. I said, I did not give birth to you to have you sit here and kill yourself now. Now get over it. <laughs> if you're depressed, seek a therapist. <laughs> And I'm not, I can, I am very loving a guy. <laughs> I don't get the wrong impression. No, I but this kid scary, needed yeah. some tough love. He yeah. didn't need this coddling crap <laughs> yeah. that he's Do been he listen? given. He just kind of went, like, snapped him out of How it. dare you talk to me like that? I'm the wanted, loved child. <laughs> oh. oh, that poor kid. Anyway. <laughs> First breakup, man. First cut is the deepest. Oh, yeah. It was, it was tough. And, so anyway, the, the, the mom and the aunt decided, oh, Carl was in ministry full time. He was a youth minister um, at a church and was going to YWAM, was uh, on staff at YWAM, Youth with a Mission. And uh, they, and I was in ministry full time, was working on church staff. And they felt with Carl's story and my story and, and um, that we ought to form this ministry. Uh, about adoption and I'm at the time I told him I said okay is this a God thing like mission this is you feel like this is from God or is this a save Carl project because those are very different and I'm feeling like it's a save Carl project and I don't think that's really gonna help (laughs) but they were so adamant like this is this is it this is the thing but wherever you go, there you are. And um, so it became about well, we're going to start this nonprofit about adoption and educating people about adoption and uh, in bits and pieces of this. Um, he would still call me in the middle of the night. In fact, at one point, he called and threatened suicide, and I said, Carl. If you call me and threaten suicide again, I will call the police and have them do a welfare check on you. And I didn't get that call again. And um, I stopped answering his calls after 10 p.m. Hmm. And then he got mad at me for not answering his calls after 10 p.m. And then he got mad at me for being for being given up for adoption. Hmm. And that's where the real stuff came out. Yeah. And. Um, and that's okay. It needed to come out. Um, and he was angry. He was really angry at being given up. I've read a lot about um, how kids in adoptive families, no matter how lovely and loving and all that, that there is still that underlying yeah. thing. That no matter yeah. how good the adoptive family is, there's yeah. still that yeah. basic. He grew up with a deep sense of abandonment. Yeah. And he grew up feeling like... I didn't want him. Right. And I was so crushed because I thought, here, here I'd done everything I thought I knew to do so that you would never feel like that. I gave you the letter. I told you why, you know. Yeah. I sent the pictures. I told, I gave you the blanket. I gave you the bear. Not that I didn't think you'd have trouble, but how would you ever on earth think I didn't want you? Like, yeah. I tried so hard to give you the perfect everything. And... That was the other side of the choice, is he felt not wanted and not, and not loved. And Which is, of course, the opposite of the situation. Completely, completely abandonment is what he feels is marked. Yeah. And, uh, is Are you guys working that out now? I think so. We went through a really, really hard hard, hard, hard time. 
um, we did start that ministry and it was good. It was really good. We spoke all over the place. I spoke to tons of women's groups, mm. not just about that, but about rape and abuse and marital abuse because I'd gone through a domestic violent marriage, my first marriage. And Oh my God. Um, so I talked to, you know, talked to women all over the place about abuse and about marital issues and about not just adoption, but that sort of thing too. But that led into that, you know, sexuality and, and just all different kinds of things. And they were flying me back there all the time. And I li I literally lived in their house when I would be back there um, with Dale and Diana. It was so enmeshed, so On very, very unhealthy yeah. enmeshment. Um, Diana would do anything for him. She adores, she loves him. I mean, that's the baby she's always wanted. And so consequently, she gives him whatever she, he wants. And... Uh, it's not always good, but mm -mm. Um, she just tried so hard to get this ministry off the ground, and she did. She got it off the ground. She's amazing. Um, so he was set up as the president of this uh, nonprofit organization. I was the vice president, and uh, but my entire life has been ministry and and nonprofit organizations, and so I, I know how to do that. Um, he was early twenties and extremely talented not his forte, not something he knows. Um, and so we clashed. Um, and uh, he wanted to add somebody to the board of directors. And the only reason he wanted to add her was he's not going to be, I'm not going to have him listen to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> was for some unhealthy reasons. <laughs> liked her. No, she was good friends with his ex-girlfriend. Oh. And so he was keeping tabs on his ex-girlfriend right classic <laughs> unhealthy <laughs> classic 20 year old though. yes I mean, very much so well, we've all been there <laughs> yeah 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 he was kind of stalking her <laughs> so oh but that's what it is he he did love her he was you know but he a person does not belong in the board director solely because they're they're good friends with your ex right so i tried to communicate that to that to him one night with his parents and uh he blew up at me started cussing me out told me to get the F out of his house. He never wanted to see me effing again and called me every single name. <laughs> just, and that was like the last straw because he'd done that before when he'd blow up at me for being mad at giving him up for adoption. He'd cuss me out and then he'd hang up on me and then he'd call me up and do it again. Did they get him in any therapy? No, they never did. Oh, that's a shame. I, I researched counselors there in the Denver area and sent them resources, but never did. Therapy. I'm a big fan of therapy. I am too. So I said, fine, I'm done. I quit. I'm not doing this anymore. We had, the next day we had to speak at this huge pro-life gathering in Iowa, in Des Moines, with several hundred people there. So I, I spoke and then he spoke and then um, I had one more women's thing to do and I did that and then I was done. I said, I'm, I'm out and I pulled all my stories off the website Everything I'd written, everything I'd blogged, all everything off. I find um, it ironic that the guy who is saying you should have aborted me and is threatening suicide would be a pro-life advocate. Is you know, I find there's an irony there, of course. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so how long ago was that? That was in 2015. So. I, it bothered me that they were, not, they weren't making tons of money, but people gave, donated to a ministry that I helped create. A lot of me was in that mm -hmm. um, designs and, and different ideas and, and my story. It's my story for crying out loud. Yeah. You know, it, 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 this is my story and you're getting up and you're telling my story about how I went to Planned Parenthood and I mean and you're asking for donations and I, that really hurt me because we're not in a relationship now and now you are saying adoption's beautiful and we are shattered people adoption's messy it's beautiful and it's ugly and it's heartache and it's
not normal. It's not natural. It's... Sometimes it's the best decision, sometimes it's the worst. I, you know, I didn't know back then what they know now about the bonds the baby has in the womb and um, being separated like that, the trauma that does on a, a baby's brain and um, the separation from its mom at birth and it's just a lot of things. And sometimes, a lot of times, I think I should have kept him. And I get mad because I could have. Because I would have been a good mom. Yeah. But I didn't. You are a good mom. You said to him, hey, get, your, get yourself together here. You know? I had his girlfriend actually come live in my house for three months. Not because I wanted to, because his mom felt that I should take her in. The ex? <laughs> the ex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the exes. There oh. were several exes. Okay. <laughs> Are you guys oh. in a better place now, or is it still taking time? It was time? hard. He, uh, um, it's still, it, so that blow up happened in January. By April, we were not talking. Mm -hmm. And, um. I, you know, I thought, okay, we'll just give ourselves some space, and I waited a couple months, and I emailed him and asked how things, no response. Diana pleaded with me not to quit the ministry, pleaded with Carl, needs you, he needs you, he needs you, it's not going to work without you, he said, it's going to work just fine without me, you don't need me. Um, and uh, then in um, I, May, I sent an email to her, I said, you know, I'd like to talk about how we can reconcile and have a relationship, you know, that's not unhealthy, but begin those first steps to at least communicating. Because um, I know I hurt Carl too. Um, quitting like that and, and saying some of the things I said, I, I, I hurt him too. And so I apologized. And I was also, at the time that they was also struggling with a, an addiction to painkillers. You were? I was. Mm -hmm. I'd had back surgery um, a couple of years prior, and I told them that before we started the ministry. I said, I'm not in a good place to do this. I'm an, I am not, I am addicted to Percocet. And by that point in my addiction, I realized um, I'm gonna lose everything, including my life, if I don't get this under control. And so I uh, checked myself into a rehab down in uh, California, inpatient. And uh, learned a lot, uh, but that's where I stopped using. And I've been clean now for two years. Good for you. Yeah. But I was using pills, popping them all the time, in part because it was so painful. Yeah. It was, I was, every time I was telling my story, I was reliving it over and over and over. Yeah. You know, and to all these groups and, and, um, so I was popping a pill to hide the pain and, and then they weren't working, so I was popping more pills and more pills. Are you in therapy now? Mm hmm. That's yeah, good. I go to meetings all the time and I have a doctor and a therapist. Yeah. And, um, I have an addiction doctor and, um, when I got out of rehab, I had an email from him that said, please don't contact me or my family ever again. And I said, um, I wrote him back. At first I wasn't going to. I wrote him back. I said, I will honor that. I want you to know that I've just gotten out of rehab. Um, and I want you to know that I'm sorry. And I listed the parts that I have responsibility for. And um, said, I'm here whenever you'd like to reach out again, if ever. And I didn't hear from him for three months. Didn't hear back, didn't hear from him for three months. 
Oh, I did hear back. Thanks for honoring my request. Hmm. And then three months went by. And I got an email. And he was uh, apologizing for his part in what happened. Hmm. And uh, took ownership of his stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said he was also seeing a therapist. Oh, a wonderful. A counselor. And um, had worked through a lot. Um, in that process, he met a woman, and she's, I guess, she's awesome from all I can tell. She's wonderful. And they got married last April. Hmm. Um, I guess not last April, but April before. Hmm. And um, he and I haven't seen each other since. We haven't spoken each, to each other over the phone at all, but we've emailed back and forth quite frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, they just had a baby, so I have a granddaughter now. And um, he asked me to fly out to his, uh, he has an annual conference for this ministry. He asked me to be the speaker in November. So I'm going to fly out and see him. It'll be the first time I see him again. How do you feel about that? I'm going out to see my granddaughter. Oh, yay. (laughs) If I speak, I speak. I don't care. Yeah. (laughs) No, I'm good with it. Um, You're an incredibly strong woman. I feel like throughout this whole story, there's this undercurrent of your wherewithal and your honoring yourself and your understanding a bigger picture than yourself. And even though you, you say, you know, there were issues with boundaries and clearly there were things that you had to learn along the way that you still understood about boundaries. You know what I mean? It seems yeah. like, I mean, they say that God doesn't give us more than we can handle. Thanks a lot, buddy. You know, I often say back, yeah. like, enough with the character. Oh, I think he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, enough with the character, just send cash. <laughs> right. So that, that saying is always like, well, really? I don't think I really <laughs> needed all this character, but <laughs> you are an impressive human. For what you have endured, it's it's amazing. Well, I don't know about all that, but I do know each each experience or each thing you learn something from or you, it is part of you. Take to the next thing. Not everybody learns, though. You sound like you you do. You, I would the person you are. I think. We come into this world with a sort of with a moxie or a strength, whatever it is, and and clearly you have ascertained, you've kept that your whole life, this inner strength. I mean, even when you were mad at God, you were still like, "Look, buddy, I'm ticked off," but you know, I know that you're okay with me being ticked off. Even that, that's a there's a sense of self to that that is remarkable for a young person. I remember when I was going through my breakup with my first husband. We had, like I said, we had a really abusive marriage. And I had a daughter that was two. And I was struggling to survive and keep her safe and me safe. And I was going through this horrible, ugly divorce. And I remember during my work lunch breaks, I would come out and I would think, I would tell God, I'm going to have my breakdown now. Right now, it's going to happen. I'm just going to get in my car. I'm going to drive, and it's going to happen. <laughs> just letting you know. And then my next thought would be, but you can't because you have to take care of Melody. Okay, but as soon as she's taken care of, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have my breakdown. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you just uh, you just do the next thing you have to do. That's the thing I think it's been throughout every single story, whether it's being... You know, dealing with rape or with uh, sexual assault or with being pregnant or the decisions you make or the the paralysis or the things you're in control of or the things you're not in control of. And most of the time we're not in control. Mm-hmm. And uh, but when we are, you just have to do the next thing. And sometimes you don't see anything beyond that. But if you can do the next thing, then you can get to the thing after that. And then sometimes 
you can get to those bigger picture goals. But in my experience in my life is that those bigger picture goals are dreams you have about this is what my life is going to be. I'm going to be this and do these things and have this thing and each step um, kind of brings us a different portrait. And it may not be the portrait that you painted in your imagination or what you wanted or but you just take the next step because if you don't then you break down and then I'm afraid if I break down I won't ever get back up yeah and it's okay to you know break down for a time like after I had Carl I didn't get out of bed for I couldn't get out of bed I just I physically could not get out of bed and I was talking to God during one of my God talk things and I said uh, we have to get on the bus so could you please help me get on the bus so we got on the bus <laughs> you just do the next thing yeah so. it's incredible and now, now the next thing for me is taking care of this little baby has cancer and her mama and your sister's daughter my sister-in-law yeah your sister-in-law Dan's uh, daughter and their five kids and all that yeah so Rebecca thank you thank you I mean you're brave and strong and uh, I think this is gonna I feel like people will hear this and it's gonna help people take the next step, you know? Thank you. Yeah. You bet. I hope so. Yeah. Bye, everybody.